Ahoy, listeners! My name is RJ, and welcome aboard to Seafarers and Scallywags, the third main campaign of Realms and Nerds. First, if you're new here, I'd like to thank you for checking out our podcast. We are so excited that you're here, and I'd also like to give you a quick rundown of our podcast's release schedule so that you know what's up. So, Realms and Nerds releases new episodes every Saturday, and those releases alternate primarily between two main campaigns, which up until now had been comprised of The Return of Ornan and The Vasanoka Adventures. Recently, we wrapped up on the first season of The Return of Ornan, and this campaign, Seafarers and Scallywags, is now taking its place in the release schedule. Actually, if you're interested, there's technically an episode zero of this campaign in the recently released bonus episode for The Return of Ornan, which saw that campaign's main heroes on a treasure hunting adventure, which featured a cameo from one of the main characters of this campaign. Anyways, my point is that due to us releasing two campaigns simultaneously, episodes for Seafarers and Scallywags will, for the most part, be out every other Saturday, with the Vasanoka Adventures mainly filling in the slot of those off weeks. Speaking of those other campaigns, if you're interested in going back and listening to Ornan or Vasanoka, at least a few of our platforms that we're on have ways that you can listen to a single campaign all the way through instead of bouncing back and forth. I know for sure that Apple Podcasts automatically has episodes sorted by season, and that's how they will play, and that over on our YouTube channel, we have separate playlists for those campaigns, and the same is true, will be true, for Seafarers and Scallywags. Now, a few notes about this campaign. Seafarers and Scallywags is a campaign that is primarily created by Bronson, who you may recall DM'd a one-off bonus episode from our first year of podcasting of the first part of an Adventurer's League quest. Uh, And more notably, you may know him for playing the roles of Mikael and Dracaris Shockwind in the Return of Ornan campaign. Lastly, a small list of thank yous. First, I'd like to thank our buddy Kyle for composing the melody of our opening theme. Secondly, I'd like to thank my co-host B, who you may know as the DM for the Vasanoka Adventures and for playing Sibo and Lililia in the Return of Ornan, for composing the melody of this campaign's closing theme. Next, I would like to thank another of my co-hosts, Harrison, who you may know as the DM for The Return of Ornan and playing Prince Lou in the Vasanoka Adventures, who has recently started helping me with some editing for the podcast, which has been a huge help and a blessing and is a big reason why we are back on a weekly release schedule. Lastly, and most importantly, I would like to thank all of you for listening. You're all amazing, and we cannot overemphasize how much your support and listenership means to us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now, without further ado, Realms and Nerds is proud to present Episode 1 of Seafarers and Scallywags. All right, you seafarers and scallywags, welcome to the SS Oculus. We'll be leaving port by morning, so make sure that you have your tobacco at the ready. And, uh, keep your seat legs about you. It'll be a while before we see land, if ever. Ha <laughs> ha! Inside the right vehicle at all times. <laughs> Your fucking expression was gold. <laughs> Dead men tell no tales. So, to introduce, we should probably introduce the port. The port that you all start at. This is where everything begins. 
You all have slipped through this treacherous subterranean grotto at different points in time. You can't exactly place where. It feels like it was a dream outside of a dream. You see a fisherman's shack ahead of you in a long boardwalk that leads out to a town that sits just on top of a peaceful bay. The times as they are right now is the sea is full of pirates. In the Navy, that's their only job right now, is trying to keep them down or out of the towns. So you will have to find a town here and there that is even friendly to you or disguise your identities. Either way, in this town, we can find slave traders. We can find all forms of villainy, all forms of prostitution and drugs from all over. Every dimension has drugs here. And as it turns out, there are also plenty of ships. One where one can hop on board and disappear and only come back as a prince of a new realm. And it is in this harbor that each one of you hopes to find a chance at a new life. So, we are actually going to start with Late Evening Cosmic Cave. Alright. Uh, Blood Evening Cosmic Cave is a female tabaxi that was born in the enchanted forest of Vermoor to the pride of tabaxi that she lives in, uh, was the noble pride over her land, her region of this jungle. On the night she was born, it was a blood moon that all the tabaxis celebrate in uh, accordance to giving their appreciation to the Cat Lord, and on this Blood Moon night in the cosmic cave of her pride, Blood Evening was born, and from there she was touched by the Cat Lord that gave her cosmic -y eyes that when you look into them you see a galaxy. She was cast and given the power and uh, you can call it a gift or a curse of curiosity, and so from then on no item or no activity could be enough for her. It didn't matter after she had her first kill or found her first treasure or explored her first dungeon in this jungle. Uh, it, it, nothing was enough. She always was looking for more. Uh, eventually, one day when she was out by the coast of the jungle, uh, a band of human men came in to the port. They, they, were, they were exploring with no good intentions and as she went to intervene and tell them to get out, they ended up kidnapping her and putting her in captivity and then selling her into slavery. She then ended up in this port. So, it is the day before she is to go to auction. Blood Evening is approached by one of the fellow slaves on the ship. She can't see his face. She can only see a beard that dangles down to his boots. Why is a slave wearing boots? That doesn't bother her. She hears his voice whisper, At the auction tomorrow, keep your wits about you. Try not to look too obvious to the rest of the crowd. And only let yourself go to the highest bidder. What, what do you mean? I have no control over these things. Oh, I'd say you have a bit of sorts about you. Not many around here are fans of tabaxi. All you have to do is demonstrate that you're a bit of a, a wild one, and nobody here will take you. They already have a reputation of being feral around these parts. So I get to choose the bitter, then? Just make yourself look like hard to catch. Very well. He passes a small coin to her and says, Look for this symbol, and when you find it, that is who you need to be sold to. And he walks away. The following morning, she is awoken from her cell and is brought towards the auction. And we are actually going to shift over to Emma. Most tabaxi tend to live secluded lives away from other societies but not Ember Horizon's parents. His parents were actually very, very well-traveled explorers who were very curious about the world around them. They were also quite young at this point, thus their reason for leaving home. But unfortunately, Ember was orphaned at the age of seven, 
when his parents left on a cruise and did not return. He grew up in the port town of Sorgenu, set in Breakneck Bay on Eclipse Island. Ember quickly took to the streets and befriended another orphan named Nartuk, a troublemaking gnome with a flair for singing. Nartuk taught Ember the art of playing music, which they used to perform for the local traders and sailors to scrounge up money. However, the two of them would always stare off into the bay, eager to join a ship's crew and see the world. Eventually, at the age of 17, Ember convinced the captain of a vessel to take him and Nartuk on as cabin boys. After a few years, pirates raided their ship and spared the two lads because of their entertaining personalities. Eventually, Ember and Nartuk became part of the crew, and at the age of 25, Ember snuck into the captain's cabin and discovered a small trinket that he became violently intrigued with. He took the trinket and immediately jumped ship with Nartuk as soon as they could for fear of getting in trouble with the ship's captain. After this, he managed to find another crew, and after a little while with them, Ember became the captain and Nartuk became his first mate. As Captain Ember grew famous for attacking merchant vessels, taking their riches, and disappearing without a trace. But, after 14 years of doing this, his crew was convinced to mutiny by the cook, who was a greedy, sleazy, fat old human known as Sloppy Joe, for his cooking habits and less than up to standard kitchen station. The only one who stood by Ember's side was his best friend Nartuk, who was gutted by Joe and tossed overboard. Ember was spared by Joe simply so he could mourn Nartuk, as he too was thrown overboard to drown in the crashing waves. As he was bouncing around in the waves, his need for vengeance boiling in his blood, his last gasping breaths, he was saved by a Triton, a sea dweller whom he never caught the name of. The Triton swam him to an unfamiliar island and left him there, where Ember cast off his pirate name for hopes that his previous crew would never realize where he was until he found them. Thus began Ember's undying quest for revenge. Ember has washed ashore not far from this port town. He finds himself only a little distance from what he assumes is a tavern. Does he enter? Of course. All right. Upon entering the tavern and ordering a drink, he um, is sitting there. And he notices a squat little man, very short, diminutive in stature, even for a dwarf. And he is poring over this map, has a tall beer, almost half as tall as he is. And he is watching him drink it, just gulp by gulp by gulp, as he laughs to himself. (laughs) And he hops up and he walks up to the bartender and glances over his shoulder over at the booth where Ember is seated. And he says to the bartender, slide me another drink over by that yonder booth. And uh, keep the change unless you're willing to look for another job. He tosses a platinum piece on the bar and heads on over. Sauntering up to the booth, he places a dagger straight into the table and says, now listen here, friend. You be looking like somebody who's looking for a crew. But what if a crew is looking for you? Would you be intrigued? There's money in it. You know what? I might take you up on that offer. I am looking for a crew. Or as you might say, a crew might be looking for me. And you know, I might be in need of one for right now. I'm kind of stranded here. Well, I can guarantee a passage to whatever port you're looking for. But at the same time, I'd give you power over a group of men, and uh, you'd only have to answer to me. You know what? That sounds reasonable. I got my own goals, but unfortunately, I can't move forward without some help. So, you got yourself a first mate. Yes, plus I can't help but think that you stink of something that reminds me. Reminds me of something I once lost. Anyway, be at the ports at dawn. And, uh, be looking for the Ocul Lazarus. It'll be right around, uh, dock number 13. Sounds all right. Thanks for the cold one, by the way. Yes, yeah, certainly. And with that, the, uh, the little man with long beard walks out of the bar. Again, 
cackling to himself, just barely scuttling underneath the doors as he walks out. <laughs> <laughs> They've got those kind of like... Yeah, swings, the saloon doors. Yeah, doors. I love it. I love doors. it. That's great. Um, All right, DM, to quote, to quote Guns N' Roses, where do we go now? Uh, yeah. Well, the next one would actually um, be oh. Ray's character. What was your uh, character's name? We'll go with Totahu. 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 Are we going with Totahu. that, or is that the name? Totahu? So, Totahu was born in a port city. He was an orphan, never knew his parents, just kind of, like, he was born in a back alley, and his parents abandoned him there, and or his mother abandoned him there, and he n- never knew where he came from. In this city, you were either a you were either a bum, or as a kid, you were either a um, a street kid, and he died hungry, or you worked in the cannery. So from a very young age, Totahu grew up, uh, or Totahu uh, worked in the cannery and butchered monsters and fish and anything that came through there. So much butchering happened that the blood pooled around uh, the waters around this cannery and they called the place Blood Harbor. Eventually, Totahu grew to hate cutting things up. He wasn't making much money and there was... He, he, he was living paycheck to paycheck in this cannery. So he pushed his way onto one of the ships that actually went out to sea to grab up the monsters and bring them to port. And he got a job as a harpooner, which on the ship was one of the most dangerous jobs. He would literally jump into the maw of monsters and shove uh, anchoring ropes into them so that they could be dragged into the harbor and would cut pieces off of them while they were still alive and he became one of the best he was fearless he had he wasn't afraid to jump in there and he was known as one of the best harpooners in this city well one day he boarded a ship with a captain who was new to this job and a crew that was new and they thought you know hey we're gonna make a lot of money out here this is gonna be great So they went out and they found a monster that was way too big for them to handle. And when Totahu jumped in and was securing the lines, the monster almost dragged the ship under. So they cut all the lines, and while he was still in the maw of the monster, he was dragged under the water deep, deep, deep down. He doesn't remember anything while he was down under the ocean, but he, when he awoke, he was floating on the top of the sea on his back. His body was different. He had various pieces of sea life, like he had the gills of a shark now, and he had sharpened teeth, and his skin was rougher to the touch. And as he looked around, he could see nothing in the distance, and eventually he washed up on the shore of some beach, and that's where he is now. As he walks towards the town, he, I'm sure, finds his way towards where the shipyards are, to where he can find a landing, perhaps, maybe a fresh drink of water. He sees the other, the rest of the port laying out ahead of him, just beyond the fisherman's shack. Does he enter? He limps his way over. So, as he enters the small port, he finds that there are no shortage of eyes that are observing his different-than-normal appearance. But at the same time, uh, there are very few eyes that have not seen such strange of a being before. There are... Not even curious, the eyes are empty, as it seemed to be just watching the passing parade of life. As he makes his way down to the dock, Todahu hears that there are many profitable ventures and many much more experienced monster-hunting captains down at the docks. Where does he decide to go? Towards the tavern or the docks? To the docks. 
Right. I like that's a question. Down at the docks, he finds uh, not many captains are willing to take aboard somebody with such a strange appearance, and he doesn't know why they're being so racist. He's just a human, after all. He finds one booth where it doesn't appear that there's anybody at it, just a ledger with uh, only two names on it, and he sees a hat just barely peeking over the edge of the table. All right, Jane. Are you looking to come aboard, or are you just going to pass along like every other weak-legged landlubber? Oh, you call me weak again, and you'll be swimming out there. I'd love to see you try. I like the way you talk, though. Not a fear of consequences. Well, what's your name on the ledger? And if uh, you don't be afraid of monsters, follow me. <laughs> I like you, little one. I like you very much. So he writes his we'll name. See how long that lasts. He writes his name big and wide, as if he was John Hancock writing his name on the Declaration of Independence. We'll be setting out before dawn tomorrow. You know that black flags sail before dawn, right? This isn't my first time on a pirate ship. Ah, good. But I, I won't have to explain a few things to you about the Navy. Ah, uh, I'll be seeing you before dawn. Oh, and uh, bring this with you. And with that, he flicks his finger and flies a platinum piece to you. He catches it without a second, or he catches it without fumbling with it. Just thunk right in his hand. I feel like there should be a dexterity check for that. <laughs> Do you want me to? I mean... Uh, expedition. Yeah. You, yeah, yeah. Expedition check. <laughs> let's, have one, let's have one roll just to mix things up tonight. <laughs> just to make it actually D&D for once. Right. Okay. For one second. Hey guys, this is my first roll with the set of dice too. Well, enjoy your critical fail. I will laugh so hard. This is going to be a good day. Wow. That's a nat 20. Damn. Nice. Oh, my dick is so erect right now. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a full chub going. He catches it with his teeth. <laughs> Just kidding. He's a regular Ace Ventura. He trail. catches it. He catches cool. it with his wiener. <laughs> cool. Just pokes through a hole. That's some mighty talented uh, tally wagon you got there. <laughs> <laughs> no, the wiener catching is the Vasanoka campaign for sure. <laughs> this is so true. The it's not my fault you guys only care about your dick. Listen, that's the way I wrote Lou, okay? Sure fucking is. Yeah. I mean, he's dead. He can do whatever he wants, okay? That was creepy as fuck. <laughs> so, uh, Liam Murphy, in his teenage years, did what most young men in his town did, uh, which was... Come on, it's supposed to be like boats and hoes. <laughs> <laughs> Take two. Yeah, take two for real. Alright. As a teenager, fuck, I can't even with you. Not to start again. (laughs) A chuckle fuck? Chuckle fuck. Chuckle fuck. Chuckle fuck, chuckle fuck. fuck. Okay. As a teenager, Lee Murphy did what most teenagers his age did, and that was join the Navy. So, a young recruit, a private, on the ship, they were boarded one day, not too long after they'd set out to sea by a ship of pirates. Now, the, uh, the crew of the Navy ship had two choices, join or die. And uh, Liam, being the young man he was and the opportunist he is, thought, this is a great career opportunity. And so, ended up taking the uh, the pledge to join this pirate ship. And that's how he spent his next about ten years out at sea, going into port every so often. And one day, while the, the ship was on leave in a port city, he overheard the tale of a great power, a great treasure, buried, hidden in a cave on an island out at sea. So, Liam, being the opportunist he is decided to rent out a boat and single-handedly sailed out to the island to procure this treasure. 
However, things don't always go as planned. And when Liam left that island, things were not the same. He had a lot to think about, and a set of knucklebone dice to carry with him. So then, Liam spent the next few years of his life studying, trying to find power that could counteract what he had encountered, what he had done in the cave on the island. And during his time on the seas, he and the crew he was a part of had gained such notoriety that Liam had gone and had to make up a new identity for himself, a new name, and has since gone by Bartholomew Blackwell. So, what has Bartholomew been doing in Days of Late? Uh, In Days of Late, Bartholomew has been continuing his studies. He has decided to try and overcome the terrible power he was granted out at sea and uh, become a cleric. So has he been, he's been studying? Yes, he's been studying in the ways of the cleric since he's come back to shore. So the monastery that he, I assume it was a monastery, that he is, or place that he has been studying, yeah, it's- is near the sea. And he decides to go into port for fish. Like he does every week, yeah. And on doing so, he happens to walk past a certain cloaked stranger who says, Now, I don't suppose you want that curse. Now, how do you know about my curse? Oh, you stink like curses. I have Happened to not got a nose for those. And you know, the nose knows. Well, I believe I can overcome this curse. Are you studying magic? Of course. Then you know in magic, the only one who can remove a curse is the one who placed it. Either by terminating their life or by making them undo it. Or with overcoming it with a greater dispel. What are you here to sell me? Only your own life back. I perhaps might know the particular person that put that stink of a curse on you. Hmm. Would you be willing to venture out to sea again? I would, but I don't know if I'm ready. Would you do it at the cost of your own life? I'd do anything at the cost of my own life. Just to end that curse? I would too. Be at the docks before dawn. Look for the Oculazarus. You'll know which ship it is. And with that, the he parts ways with you, and um, you're left with things to think about. And the temptation of going back out on the sea. He only has to decide to take opportunity. And with that, we leave Liam Murphy. All right. <clears throat> Tevon Aldis is a member of the Bloodlust clan, a nomadic group. He is a member uh, of this clan and has now become something of a, a chieftain. They don't really recognize much in the way of hierarchical order outside of the main three. Uh, There was a long time ago a struggle between several uh, members of the clan for who would lead. And after many were killed in this struggle, it was found that three were almost uniquely matched in strength. So rather than pitting themselves against each other ongoing, they decided to forge a pact. And together this trio has ruled their clan for many years. It turns out that one of these members, known by the nickname the Bone Crusher, is Tevon's father. So from a very early age, Tevon has been groomed to someday be the leader of this clan, and he has fought many wars and gone on many raiding parties as he has slowly gained his power. Now, uh, he's about middle age, and uh, he's been so successful in his various exploits that he's been given a new mission by the, the trio. They have asked him to go out as far as he needs to go to the east, potentially even to sea, to look farther, 
and try to find new lands for them to conquer so that they can expand their territory. So armed with this uh, particular quest, he has gathered his belongings, said his goodbyes to his family, and has left the clan in search of new areas to expand their greatness. Wait, hold on. Is this the same Tevon? Hmm. What do you mean the same Tevon? Wasn't there a Tevon when we broke out of jail? The what? No. Guy? That was Tevon. That, that Te- was Tevon. <laughs> <laughs> he was Discount Dracaris. Maybe? What? <laughs> Discount I don't remember. Dracaris. Oh, the big guy! I'm pretty sure his name I is Tevon. I think his Tevon. name was also Tevon. Was he orc? Yes. Was he a half orc? I thought he was human. Yeah. I thought no, he was just a, a big fucker. He was a are we are we retconning I, this I, is I the guess same I, dude? I guess we could retcon it. That explain where he went. I that's true. Cause I made up the name. I wasn't even thinking about that. We met up with, to look into that. He was with the. He met up with Joshimi. He met up with Joshimi and wanted to go to the Wolf's Hold crew. Yeah, for yeah. and then he took off. Yeah, we'll see. Maybe that'll be retconned in. Cause I totally made up the name without thinking about that. We're in a completely alternate dimension. Well, I. Th- but there's still a portal. To explain to the world. this, I like to think to of the world as the size of Jupiter. Universes. Okay. All right. So. Tevin's fallen on hard times and um, has been looking for work and to fill the time and to find more recruits has taken up position as a barkeep. That seems likely. He is also something of an alcoholic. Hmm. Harrison's character is an <laughs> alcoholic. Whoa. So he has happened upon a job at a tavern. In a local port town. And he's figured, hey, free alcohol, plus make money, find recruits. It's enterprising enough. And he's gotten out of the house for a little bit. (laughs) So, as he's serving drinks a particular night, he's noticed a certain ruckus. And oddly enough, there's been a tabaxi that has come through the bar that evening. And after noticing a particularly... Loud, regular customer who is always stirring up a mess and making a, a nuisance of himself of rather squat stature. He uh, approaches the bar and says, If you're looking for adventure, take the, the change of this platinum piece and uh, follow me down to the market the next day. We'll see what happens. Just do as I tell you. Oh, and... Uh, Bring a beer over to that booth. On me. Flip some platinum bees. <sighs> All right. Tevon takes it. He pours uh, two beers. One he keeps behind the bar. One he gets ready to carry. He also pours a uh, not unsubstantial sized uh, shot of whiskey. Slides it over to his customer that has just tossed him the platinum piece. What time do you want me to be there? Uh, two hours before dawn. That's when the slaver's market opens up. Should I come uh, prepared to travel, or are we just doing a quick job? Oh, I'd say pack your bags. It'll be worth your time, I promise. But uh, definitely be prepared to participate. All right, and he uh, he picks up his beer that he poured himself and dra- downs about half in one long gulp. Is there drink where we're going? Oh, if you leave it to me and you, there'll be more than just plenty of liquor in the in the hold. All right. He pushes the uh, the glass of whiskey that he has poured for his customer a little bit closer to him and says, I'm in. Well, after that, the short customer has taken and drank the whiskey. Walks over and seems to have business with the tabaxi and quickly exits the bar. Hello everybody, this is Harrison.
Hey everybody, RJ here. I hope you're enjoying this episode of Realms and Nerds. If you're not already, please subscribe to the show and turn on notifications so you don't miss any episodes. It's available on pretty much every platform out there, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube. Once you're subscribed, consider sharing the show with a friend. Word of mouth is the best way to help us grow. Thank you so much to our friend Kyle for composing the melody of our main theme. And of course, as always, thank you for listening. We appreciate all of you, and we're so grateful to have your support. Now, back to the action. Fast forward to the next morning. Does he wake up two hours before dawn? Actually, how about you roll me... Well, I was actually going to say, I think if it's two hours before dawn, I don't actually think that Tevon has gone to bed yet. Because he's a bartender and he's working the night shift, so I think that currently he's probably sleeping during the day and staying up most of the night. So I think at this point he's not sleeping in the night very much. So instead, he chose to stay uh, awake, hopefully um, not get too hammered. Right, I think, yeah. Like, I think well, most... Fuck it, gotta work in the morning. <laughs> Mo- I think most nights, if it's not too eventful, he just settles back and throws a few down and then eventually falls asleep in the early hours of the morning. If he's got something to do, he maybe goes a little bit easier, but he's definitely... I don't think he's gone to bed, for sure, because he, he stays up most of the night most days well into the early hours right right okay so as he's approaching the market he sees the person he's supposed to meet from the night before just outside who's waving to him indicates follow me this way as he approaches and he sees that the slave market is going on and his companion who is quite diminutive of stature Motions for him to kind of kneel down and follow him, and then they get to the middle of the crowd, and then he leans over and says, All right, put me on your shoulders. All right, Tevon puts him on his shoulders. By the way, Tevon is 6'10. Jesus, so taller uh, than me. the dwarf is now well, well, elevated. well, abo- well elevated. And up on the, uh, the gallery where the slaves are being shown, you can see that there are a an assortment of non-humans that are specifically being sold and marketed for their particular racial qualities that would make them uniquely useful. And you can see among them a Tobaxi, who is being advertised as a little bit more than a house slave. And as the bids go up, There appears to be a bit of a a ruckus going on on stage. She seems to be really on out of hand, out of hand. You can't treat me like this. This is brutality. And totally doesn't seem to be like the rest of the feral ones, but rather refined, but angry. So, okay, can I ask you a question? I think, sure. Does Tevon, I think, maybe know this dwarf fairly well, at least? You said he's a regular? He's a regular, but he's never given away personal details. But he at least would know his personality to some extent, right? A small degree. Okay. So I think when he sees this going on on stage, Tevon's going to kind of tilt his head up to the dwarf on his shoulders and say, That one seems like the one you want. Well... I can see you've been watching a bit more than just the maps that I've been pouring over, or how much my tab is. Seems like you found the objective for the day. They what? don't like me too much down here, so how about you do the bidding? And with that, he hands him a, a signet medallion that's with him. Okay, is this like a... a symbol. Is this like something I would use to bid with, or is it just like a, a piece? Like, do I recognize it, I guess? The bidders indicate that they wish to bid by raising their hand. Okay. It's more or less a silent auction, but he tells you to wrap it around your wrist like like a bracelet, just showing the, the medallion towards the front. 
Okay, yeah, Te- Tevon does that. Bloody evening. Noticing the medallion standing out amongst the bidders as one of only a couple of hands that have gone for the minimum bid. And notices said object. Upon seeing this medallion with a insignia on it that appears to her to match the one that she was given the other night in the jail, she immediately goes full beast on the two men that are standing on either side of her and let her claws out and scratch both of them across their face and push them to the side, trying to make herself appear as something that someone would not want roaming around their home. And with that, uh, the other two hands in the crowd drop, and she is quickly suppressed by the heavily muscled and heavily armored guards next to her. There you go, the salesman says. This one's full of energy. You can see she's just ready to go. I still want her. All right, and uh, we're looking for hands. We've got uh, ten gold pieces, ten gold pieces, and uh, one, two, three sold to the orc. Yeah. He's going to use her as a maid. (laughs) Tevon's going to take large strides up to the front, just like like sort of pushing his way through the crowd, almost regardless of who's standing in front of him. Oh, just hold your place, mister. All sales are uh, final once the auction's over. Just an hour before dawn. Did the dwarf get off of his shoulder at this point, or is he still up there? Still up there. <laughs> okay. So I guess when he says that, I'm just going to kind of glance up to him for a affirmation, if we're going to wait. Yeah, I can tell this galoot's never been to a slave auction before. He probably doesn't get up much before noon. It's all right. We'll wait for our purchase out at the, at the receipt gate. Fucking Yoda and mm-hmm. Luke. Tevon's just going to grunt and step back a few paces. So, with that, they head um, over towards where the transactions are finalized. And once they reach the spot, they uh, immediately demand for payment. 50 gold pieces. Instead of saying anything, Tevon is going to... He carries a broadsword. This is a particular broadsword. So his nickname is The Butcher. Partially because of his fierceness in battle, but also because he carries a broadsword that is fashioned to look like a giant meat cleaver. So he's going to take this and slam it down into the center of the table. You said ten. And with that, the ten guards that are just around the table immediately lower their spears and... They step around you, and the small man who is uh, operating the books, very small and also very thin, simply lowers his gaze, looks up at you, and says, Fifty gold pieces. That was the bid. And with that, the small man on your shoulders leans over and says, Oh, just pay the man. But this is uh, robbery. I will not stand for this. Yeah, well, we're robbing them of the rest of their life. How much more can that be for 50 old pieces? <sighs> can I cut his head off later? Yeah, if we meet him out on the sea, his rules are all mine. Uh, fine, it is your money. Uh, I'm glad you see it that way. Let's be on our way with our prize. All right, I will uh, dislodge my sword from the table and put its back in its sheath. Ah, good. I wasn't planning on a fight today. And uh, I guess, are you handing him the 50 gold pieces, I assume, or does he already have them? Uh, He reaches into Tevon's purse and pulls them out and pays. Okay. How has Bloody Evening's temper and demeanor behaved since she was manacled and muzzled? After she was subdued again, she is not stop giving up a fight so as she's being dragged out right up towards the the final purchase correct okay and on uh seeing the large half orc and the man sitting on his shoulders what does she do she calms down a little as they approach the gate but still isn't really making it like easy for these guys at which point the uh small man on uh the orc's shoulders Calls out, Oi now, missy, uh, no reason to be fighting. I promise ye, no harm will come to ye as long as ye 
play nice. No, no malice is meant in that, dearie. She just remains silent and glares at this whole si- uh, situation, just waiting for them to untie her and take this, this muzzle off of her. And if you're calm for me, I'll even let you kill. Her mouth is covered, but you can see the glint in her eyes. She almost smiles. Well, that's a grin there. He motions for the, the men who take the manacles off. And of course, they escort her outside of the gate where they can be eventually released into the hands of their handlers. At which point, they're also handed a, a contract stating their whole, you know, what has to take place with slavery and all that. And with that, the small man actually takes the contract, rolls it up, and slips it into a small bag that uh, he has behind him and says, All right, now with you both of you, down to the docks. I've uh, got a <clears throat> ship to manage. All right, before we walk away, Tevon actually is going to go back to the man who's collecting the money, the guy with the glasses, and lean over. I think he walks up kind of behind him, leans over next to him, so he's kind of got his face next to the side of his head, and he just says, Your treachery is not forgotten. And then he turns around and walks away. Uh, As he's walking away, the guy at the desk looks at him and says, Well, neither is your face. (laughs) Play it cool. Play it cool, Tevon. And so with that, I take it they're heading towards the docks following uh, this dwarf. Yes. Yeah. All right. (laughs) Just to move things along. (laughs) No murder hobo. I listen. It's not murder, I hobo. Mean, we didn't go through all the things that I chose for my character here, all my personality traits. But yeah, we'll just say that he's very uh, vindictive. No combat yet, right? <laughs> Bronze is like, uh, we weren't ready for I that. Didn't have stats for that guy. <laughs> he was. He's. He's a little vindictive. No need for stats. I mean, he just gets his head cut off. That's wonderfully useful. <laughs> As this dwarf is leading Blood Evening away, she calmly asks him, Where is it that you are taking me? Oh, you're about to board the finest ship that ever sailed the sea. The SS Alkia Lazarus. You're taking me back onto the water? Don't you have to cross the water to get to where you came from? Well, yes, but I was never intending to go back there. I never thought I'd be back. Well, you're royalty where you come from, aren't you? How are you supposed to know that? Look at your clothing. Nobody of lower rank would wear such fine garments. (laughs) Most of this is what they put on me afterwards. Yes, but I'm talking about the garments on your heart. You're not of one of these mudbloods. You're not one of these common folk. It is true. Well, follow me. Join me, crew. You're free at this moment, but only to us. Okay, but don't ask me to swim. Oh, I doubt you'll be doing much swimming where we're headed. Good. This ship has never sank in all of its 32 crews. What happened to the other 31 crews? Oh, uh, they all uh, left employment in whatever ways they saw fit. Seems fair. (laughs) <laughs> they did. <laughs> now shall we uh, head on? It's going to be getting light soon. Yes, let's let's be going. All right. And with that, y'all head towards the docks. Down at the docks, you uh, see not a full crew. You only see another three sailors waiting for you, and two of them are here. As this uh, dwarf, this tabaxi and this half-org are walking up to the docks. The dwarf is the only one who is familiar to everybody who is in that party. He is the only one who all of them have seen before. Other than the Tabaxi is familiar to uh, to Tevan as the customer who this dwarf had spoken to at the bar the other night. It seems kind of strange to him, but he doesn't otherwise know. And... They seem quite an understaffed crew for the ship that they'd be taking until they notice that the ship itself is not all that large. But as they approach 
and the features come a little bit more into place. The man speaks up and says, Welcome, all of ye. My name is Littlebeard. You're all here to board the SS Oculazarus, which you can see there in the water. Not the big ship there. The little one there. You never told me that I'd be working with cats. Oh. <sighs> it doesn't matter what you thought you'd be working with. You're on my ship and part of my crew. And you've done the deed. You'll be joining us at sea. There's a position marked for you. How does your ship have an eye? Oh, I had it installed and uh, built into the original structure. I knew the carpenter very well. A uh, mysterious man. You wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to mess with him. All right, Captain. I don't mean to harp on your parade there, but what kind of an eye is that? Did you get that from somewhere else? Uh, did you get that from some kind of a creature? Or did you have that built in? Oh, are you saying you're backing out of the voyage, even though you bought your way on? Not hardly. Not hardly at all. The I'm rather looking forward to this. Consequence. But, but where'd the eye come from? If I were to tell you, you'd be so uncomfortable. All right. And I don't like my crew to be uncomfortable. Land lovers. I have bathed in the blood of thousands of men. Nothing makes me uncomfortable. For yourselves, but the water sure as hell freaks me out. Oh, don't worry, darling. I'll make sure you don't fall overboard. Mm. Oh, no. I didn't pair you to boxy as kittens. What? Ember just looks at him like, really? I ain't no kitten. He says as he pulls his uh, ball of yarn out and starts playing with it. So this is the crew that you have set upon to help me? Help you? What do you mean, help you? As far as I was concerned, this is Captain's ship. This is his mission, his quest. I wasn't planning on doing anything for you. And your crew. All right, mate. Point by you. They'll turn out to be, I think, the finest crew that you have laid eyes on. They have potential. Oh, they have potential. Well, it's debatable, but I mean, I'm not going to argue with you. Aye. Right. Best gets down to uh, setting out duties. Tohotu? Yes, Captain. You're away in anchor. So for that, once everyone's aboard, I'll need you to go down and loose it from a couple of rocks that are down there in the bottom. Aye, Captain. And, uh, when it's ready, just hang on. We'll haul you. <laughs> Aye, Captain. Right then, ball follow me. Aye. I'll need you at the helm. Aye, Captain. Tavon. Find yourself a place in the galley. The galley would be where the provisions are stored, am I correct? Uh, if you're talking about liquor, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Right then. Eve. Yes. Get yourself below decks. There's less sun down there. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and uh, clean the guns while you're down there. The what? You know, uh, it's... I... The guns. <laughs> Listen, darling, there are a bunch of tubes down there. You just a bunch of metal pipes. Cannons. Yeah. All you gotta do is take we a rag really and done. wipe them out. Just make sure they're ready for gunpowder and the shot. Well, I'll try my best. I cannot promise anything, though. Right. Well, let's all board. All right, you're the captain. Let's get her underway. And with that, <laughs> Little Beard leads the way onto the ship. Nobody notices, but as the last of the passengers, well, as the crew Eve cautiously members, enters the boat, the eye moves.